That's the section of scripture that was used to say you can't wear jewelry. Please. <laughs> Come on. No Bible exposition will lead you to that conclusion. That's not how you read scripture. Because I'd be worried about yourself. Why you still be doubting you got a soul? Like you need to see to believe these things. But you believe things that you've never seen. Like feelings and hopes and dreams. The future emotions and gravity. And sadly, everything you're rejecting makes this whole life a tragedy. And I got something to say. I got something to say. I got something to say. Welcome to the Malcolm E Podcast. I'm Leslie. And I'm Andrew. And if you haven't seen the first part of this episode, go and check that out. But here's part two. I think I felt that you were a little bit disturbed or upset maybe when I started wearing makeup. Well, because I didn't, I didn't want, um, the idea is not you have to have this in your life. And personally, I think you're beautiful. I don't think there's any need for that. So I don't, I don't think makeup helps anyone's face as far as like, even health wise, because a lot of people that have regular makeup routines usually have a huge like discoloration in their skins mm -hmm. because the sun doesn't break through, they get acne. I see it as actually something that might cause like blemishes and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So I'm like, don't, you don't need it. Like you're good. Like don't ruin your face. Well, he uh, never said that. He, I just knew I had that feeling that he doesn't like it. And I wasn't and sure. And I don't want the obsession with it either. I wasn't sure yeah. if it was the apostolic talking, if that makes sense. Because the whole tattoo thing for me, it was like, wait a minute, slow down. <laughs> like just, let's just take it baby steps. Yeah. But after that, I mean, you got your tattoo. It took us a while to find a church, a new church. That was another experience. But it did help with the process going being surrounded with other believers true believers mm -hmm. meeting people it, it it helped us the it, the transition was a lot more smoother yeah we, we not not too much like oh my goodness i'm gonna go to hell because i'm going to a different church it helped to bring peace in mind and and that was it that i think that was our journey from leaving and where we are where we are now. Yeah. And now we could go to the next phase of this conversation. Yeah. The so question. This is where are we? Um what what I thought was interesting is uh we had a question that a friend of Leslie's asked her. And I get a lot of questions. She does. I, I get like, why'd you guys leave? I'm noticing a lot of people leaving. There is, there is somewhat of an exodus from the apostolic church, believe it or not. Uh, you'll probably never hear that in the assembly, but there is a huge uh, nationally. And some people, people don't, that are leaving. don't uh, post it. I mean, they just bounce. They just bounce. <laughs> <laughs> so what was the question? Uh, she had a friend that asked her a question. I figured we could just do a little breakdown of it. Um, it would take about, I don't know how long, but we'll try to be intentionally detailed He'll do most of the talking for this part of the episode, yeah. just letting you know. All right. So here is the message that a friend of Leslie sent her. Um, so this is the one we're actually answering in this episode. So question was that, what changed your perspective in being okay to wear pants and jewelry from the apostolic rules? Okay. Very common. Yeah. I think we kind of answered it a little bit, but you could go into the yeah, details. Yeah, we'll go into the detail. Um. When I was in the assembly, I reached uh, um, the position of unofficial deacon because I was functioning as a deacon, but I, I didn't get like the, the badge and the plaque or whatever else comes with it. Um, so in the church, I was leading the Bible studies. I was able to assist in the Lord's Supper, um, uh, setting things up, preaching. Um, so... We were also going to Bible college. And in in Apostolic Bible College, you get like books to work through stuff. And this uh, this is an interesting one. Um, it's the Apostolic Doctrines and Disciplines um, by Eduardo Iglesias. And this is for the first year in Bachelor's of uh, Theology. And there are several of these books. I have a second one. I have a third one. Um, but this one, I wanted to touch on something that was being taught because uh, it shows 
the way that jewelry is actually viewed in the assembly and how it is taught actually dogmatically. So this isn't just an opinion and I'm not being mean. I have nothing to say, but here's the truth. Here's why this is either right or wrong. So here's what it says. It says jewelry. Um, the objective is of this lesson is to show the dangers associated with its functionality and how many are led astray through pride in relation to jewelry. A look at the Holy Scriptures will reveal why the Apostolic Assembly of the Faith in Christ Jesus adheres to a strict ban on jewelry. So this isn't something that we're making up. Mm -hmm. um, now, recently, some churches, some individual churches have lifted some parts of those bands saying, hey, you can you know, wear a wedding ring. Just don't leave the church for a ring. I agree with that statement. Don't leave the church for something silly, <laughs> but understand some of the things that are being taught wrong in your church. Uh, if someone leaves the church because they want to wear a wedding ring, I mean, they have the right to leave. But if they start saying that that church uh, is mean because of a wedding ring rule, that's silly. That makes no sense. But that is just one thing that talks about or points to the fact that there's a problem in the teaching. So it says here, uh, reasons for wearing jewelry differ but are not limited to one category, such as team affiliations, clubs, causes, personal taste, etc. Jewelry has been defined as a gauge of how successful one is in life or as a sign of a higher social class. Also as a demonstration of how much one loves another. Jewelry is also used to enhance beauty as a standalone and to those who wear it. Unfortunately, this is the strong part in this. Unfortunately, jewelry is also the glitter which attracts and surrounds the criminal mind and is the cause for much heartbreak. The value associated with jewelry has made it the basis of criminal activity in heists, murders, kidnappings, and extortions. Mm. All right. Scripturally, jewelry is the producer of pride and arrogance, as stated in Isaiah, and as such will bring instability upon the Christian's life. Okay. We cannot say that because people steal jewelry, that jewelry um, is, is to be considered a cause of heartbreak. No, sin is the cause of heartbreak. You want to know why people steal? Because they're sinners and they're violating the commands of God. Yeah. Thou shalt not steal. They're, they're just showing their disrespect or uh, disconcern for God's word. Uh, mankind does not become sinful once it starts sinning. Mankind reveals its sinfulness in the sins that it commits as a human race. So you don't have to wait till someone lies to know that that person's a sinner. But when they lie, you can identify, see, this identifies you as a sinner as well as all the other things that identify you as a sinner. Why? Because God's commands say, do not lie, do not steal, do not covet, do not commit adultery, do not take the Lord's name in vain, uh, uh, honor your mother and your father. Uh, like it's, it's, it's very clear to see what it is that, that identifies us. This, this uh, teaching already begins on the, on the point saying, look, jewelry bad, stay away from jewelry. Why? Because criminals. Like that, you can't do that. You can't do that with the Bible. That the Bible isn't silly like that. And here's what I mean by silly. It doesn't make odd statements that don't really connect. And like, you know, God didn't, uh, it's so odd to see like, that in a bachelor's degree program. Like jewelry, bad, why? Crime. You're gonna Come on. cause someone to rob you. And God's gonna look at you like, yeah, this, you shouldn't have wear that ring. Yeah, that, that makes like no sense. Like jewelry, jewelry is evil because people want to steal it. Uh -huh. Please You're hold on. Giving yourself attention. Are bodies evil because people want to steal them too? Are babies evil because people want to kidnap them too? Are cars evil because people want to break in and steal those too? Is money evil because people want to steal it too? Come on, if you can use this statement about jewelry, you should be able to use it about everything that allures and attracts mm -hmm. criminal activity. You can't do that. So this is a very strange position to take, uh, but this is why this is a legalism. This is a, a man's opinion being taught as the laws of God, um, trying to become holy or, 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 or special 
um, by doing something on your own. Um, Does it say the verse? Do they no, no, no. But I will. I'll, I'll pull it up. It says okay. in the next section. So here's here's the section that gets really messed up. Um, uh, page seventy four. It, it goes into some stuff, but I don't want to. I don't want to take too long. Okay. Um, it says because of the, it. It's quoting Isaiah three verse 16 to 23. I'll read that in a second, but I want to say what it's quoting. It mm -hmm. says, because of the arrogance and pride that has built up in the women of Zion, Isaiah makes a list of things God will remove from his people. There appears to be a stripping away, not only of the jewels, but also of the ornate dresses and other clothing. God's word to the nation's Bible version states in plain English that the Lord will take away on that, what the Lord will take away on that day. Isaiah refers to the day of the Lord as a day of cleansing and of putting away everything that hinders honor and glory to God. If it were true that jewelry does not hinder service to God, why does he take away the finer things in life? A closer look at the following list will reveal certain articles that are considered indispensable in any wardrobe apart from jewelry. Uh, gives a list of things, headbands, nose rings, bracelets, shawls, mirrors, headdresses, underwear, undergarments, ankle bracelets, jingling anklets, signet rings, pendants, coats, hats, blouses, charms, crescent-shaped necklaces, fine robes, scarfs, purses, perfume boxes, and veils. Okay. So it's basically saying jewelry hinders your service to God. And the reason that you come to this conclusion is is because God is going to take this away as a judgment. And then it goes on to say, we may discard some items on this list as jewelry, but there seems to be a few that we might question. There is no argument as to the necessity of coats, shawls, purses, since they serve a function. There exists a danger when used inappropriately. A person itself does not pose a threat, but a highly decorated, visibly noticeable attention getter might open the door to pride. The use of clothing, such as blouses, hats, scarves, and veils, fall under the same category when used to draw attention to us. Now, what, what I agree with is, if you are using your stuff to show off, yes, that's pride. That's arrogant. That, that reveals where the heart already is. Having a purse doesn't make you proud. It could inspire pride, but pride comes from the heart. Mm -hmm. um, the starting point is in our sinful natures. So the description is saying, you know, you can have stuff, um, but you can't have stuff that, you know, attracts people or leads you to pride. But then in that same list, it says, hey, jewelry is there, like rings and bracelets and stuff like that. So you got to do away with that completely. But purses, you, you have to do away with them only if they're, shiny and flashy and showy. So here's the problem. The problem is, so I'm going to dive into Isaiah 3 real quick to show where, where they're referring to. Um, the whole first section of Isaiah 3, Isaiah 3 chap, uh, verses 1 to uh, 12, this is a judgment that God is bringing out saying, this is the misbehavior of Israel this is the judgment that I'm going to bring on them. They're misbehaving, so I'm going to take away all the things that they like in life. Um, I'm going to bring misery on them. I'm going to, I'm going to ruin them through judgment. Um, and then when it continues on from verse 13, it says, The Lord arises to contend and stands to judge the people. The Lord enters into judgment with the elders and princes of his people. It is you who have devoured the vineyard. The plunder of the poor is in your houses. What do you mean by crushing my people and grinding the face of the poor, declares the Lord God of hosts. And here we go. Moreover, the Lord said, because the daughters of Zion are proud and walk with heads held high and seductive eyes and go along with mincing steps and tinkle the bangles on their feet. Therefore, the Lord will afflict the scalp of the daughters of Zion with scabs and the Lord will make the, their foreheads bare. In that day, the Lord will take away the beauty of their anklets, headbands, crescent ornaments, dangling earrings, bracelets, veils, headdresses, ankle chains, sashes, perfume boxes, amulets, finger rings, nose rings, festal robes, outer tunics, cloaks, money purses, hand mirrors, undergarments, 
turbans, and veils. Now it will come about that instead of sweet perfume, there will be uh, putrefaction. Instead of a belt, a rope. Instead of well-set hair, a plucked-out scalp. Instead of fine clothes, a donning of sackcloth. And branding instead of beauty. Your men will fall by the sword and your mighty ones in battle. And her gates will lament and mourn. And deserted, she will sit on the ground. That's the section of scripture that was used to say you can't wear jewelry. Please. (laughs) Come on. No Bible exposition will lead you to that conclusion. That's not how you read scripture. You can't read the judgment of God on all nations, uh, specifically on, on Judah and Israel, saying, you proud, boastful Israel, you're my people and you mistreat my people. How dare you? I will judge you. I will take away everything that shows you that there's favor on you. Come on. God blesses people with prosperity and the ability to enjoy this life for his glory Mm -hmm. and to live it out effectively unto the praises of his name. He gives people things and he supplies them with resources so they can have and live and use this life in a proper way that doesn't boast or put stuff on a pedestal to show off or to be all all like full of arrogance and pride. Mm -hmm. But instead, they're rejecting God, using the blessings, and just like just adorning themselves like with arrogance. So he's saying, all right, I'm going to take away everything that gives you any sort of comfort or any feeling of support, and you're going to recognize your, your destruction. He's talking, about rip, he's talking about bringing baldness onto the scalp of a woman. He's talking about their, their young men, their mighty, mighty warriors will all die in battle. You can't say, oh, God's going to take away nose rings and bracelets um, and he's going to pluck out the scalp and give you guys head diseases and you're all going to, you're going to have men that die in battle. Because of that, you shouldn't wear jewelry. Jewelry is evil. What are you talking about? This is a judgment where God takes away everything, even life. This is not an identifier saying jewelry has caused you to be proud. Like, that's just not it. So uh, I, I think it's interesting when we evaluate what a piece of scripture is talking about and we realize that if somebody comes to you and says, hey, if you want to be holy, um, you know, take that, take that ring out of your nose or take that bracelet off your hand. It's like that doesn't make you holy. That technically makes you holy, like it sets you apart because holiness is you being set apart. But that's not coming from the heart. That's not necessarily what God is telling you to do. Now, there might be people in a certain environment where they are raised to think that if they wear things, they are special. And once they come to Christ, yeah, and once they come to Christ, you might see them rid themselves of that because that has been their idol. Their hearts have been clean. They're free. They don't need to. They don't care to. But that doesn't mean that wearing a wedding band or a bracelet or necklace is sinful or idolatrous. It doesn't mean that you are searching for approval from the world. Can you? Yes. How many people, honey, how many, have you ever, because I've seen it, it made me sick to the stomach even when I was in the assembly. Have you ever had that time where you walk in and the first like what, 15 minutes of the music playing before the preaching starts, you see women showing off the Michael Kors purses to other women in the background or the new shoes and they're there just gogging at each other? Have you ever seen that? Yes. Okay. All the time. <laughs> Apostolic church. I was one of those women. <laughs> no bracelets, no rings, no necklaces. And the pride is through the roof. The arrogance and boasting is right there in the house of God. Come on. I mean, you're not can't... making this go away by telling people they can't wear rings and now you're or... holy. Man, you got a $500 purse? We, this we're... thing costs $600. It's not a necessity for life. I use it for work and I can use it and it helps me. This is an expensive piece of jewelry watch. It it connects to my phone. We have that. We have pastors with watches and iPads. You don't need this stuff. We can't look at this and say, not jewelry, jewelry. This thing costs 15 bucks. (laughs) This thing costs 500. Are you serious? Like, this is what sometimes makes me like react this way. Like, you're really putting a burden on people, mm-hmm. telling them, 
you can't be holy if you put on a $10 ring, but you can wear a $1,500 person to church. Talk about humility. Don't play. Just understand you're going to violate the apostolic rules in secret ways when you have a flashy purse. We, we but live you're, in a materialistic world. You live That's in a what... world. It's not even that. It's, it's You live in a world where we use things, mm-hmm. but you're telling people these three things are bad. Those four things are good. You're holy I, now. I, I honestly think thing. that if we were still there, I will get judged and Chris how I display and decorate my home. To well, be what's honest. wrong with your home? Well, just like if you have a very expensive TV, the biggest TV, you'll get looked on like, hey, like, I don't know. I just feel like that. That's what I get when in in this kind of church. No. Like if you. If uh, I don't think so. Well, I don't know. It's just it's messed up because they 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 pick and choose what they want to be holy and unholy. Mm -hmm. And then they put it as a burden and they say, this is from God. Now you're disobeying God. That's the problem. When you tell somebody they're disobeying God because they don't do it the way that you want to in your church, but you're actually taking scripture out of context to make those points, that's legalism, that's wrong. And that's the stuff that puts this burden on women that are afraid to pray without their head covered in a veil. Like I've had that. I uh, worked on an ambulance, had a sister from the church, picked her up. She was having like anxiety or something, picked her up to transfer her to the hospital. I'm like, hey, hermana, como estas? You know, and she was scared to pray because she didn't have a veil. I'm like, mm, hermana, Dios está aquí. I'm too. like, Dios está aquí. Vamos a orar. Like, let's pray. Like, you're I'll- anxious going through depression. I'm here to help you. And it took her a little while to realize she can freely pray with me. So we prayed. Goodness, she was scared to pray in one of the most anxious moments of her life. What are we doing to people? And that happened to me. Yeah. <laughs> I was working at Marshall's and there was this uh, co-worker of mine who came to faith, but not in an apostolic church. So to me, it's like, oh, his his faith is invalid. And he was going through a, an emotional breakdown while working. And he knew I was Christian. And he came up and like, can you please pray with, with me, for me? Like I need, pe-. and I'm like, Oh, I'm sorry. I can't. I don't have my veil with me. Mm -hmm. That was me. That's messed up. That's the stuff that you get when Uh, you're in a unbiblical location or unbiblical church that teaches you that it's it's weird. It's so close to being Catholic. Like you have to be in the church to pray. God's not going to really hear you if you're not in the church. And the head covering, that's another topic to talk about. Yeah, we'll we'll cover that on another day. Yeah. Um, Yeah. See here. Where are we at? Is that the only scripture they use as reference for the jewelry part of the book? Uh, in that book, no, they use several about pride, okay. about arrogance. Okay. Um, but but the two sections that are most popular that actually say the word adorning uh, is First Timothy chapter two and First Peter chapter three. So we're going to touch on that. Um, and- so First Timothy chapter two. Um, it, it it's really verse nine that we're going to hit, but Which it's one is it? the first Timothy, first Timothy. but it's important yes, to uh, start at the beginning of the chapter. So yes. it says, first of all, of, of course, this is actually talking about in the local church, in the gathered church. First of all, then I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men for Kings and all who are in authority so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator, also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle, I'm telling the truth. I am not lying as a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Therefore, I want the men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. 
All right, again, this is talking about in the local church. This is talking about the behavior and the attitudes and the intentions that we should have in the local church. Okay. So uh, the reason is that we need to understand this is because First Timothy, uh, he, uh, Timothy was in Ephesus with the people. So he was a pastor in, the Eph in uh, Ephesus to the Ephesian church. And he was responsible for raising up, mentoring, and sponsoring uh, others to go into uh, deaconship, into uh, being bishops and other pastors to take over elders. And it's saying, you know, I want you as a collective, as a church, to be able to pray for all people, all kinds of people, even the people you don't like, the people that are in authority, the Romans, whatever, like pray for them. Why? Because uh, verse four, uh, verse 3, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, verse 4, who desires all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. No, this does not mean that God is going to save every single person. He isn't. Uh, he never says he will. The Bible shows that he isn't going to. He's going to judge many to hell. But from all walks of life, in all positions of government and society, God will save and desires to save people from those groups whether you're a king whether you're a ruler whether you're a master whether you're a pagan whether you're a heathen it doesn't matter god has a desire and he will accomplish his desires to save people from all them so you can't be in church saying we're not going to pray for the romans you don't have a choice like not as not as an obedient christian as an obedient christian we should have that mind state saying like he needs prayer too she needs prayer too why could they they might come to saving faith and we never know if god's going to save them like god might save anyone um, so it's, it's important to read in, in context. So this whole section is talking about when you're gathered together in the mind state you should be having regularly, be willing and open to pray for all people everywhere. Um, and then verse 8, it goes again saying, I want men to lift up holy hands without wrath and dissension, meaning don't be argumentative. Um, don't have this uh, whole attitude where you're being rude and bickering and talking smack about people. Then you come into church and you pray even though you were just making fun of someone or talking smack about someone else or you got bad relationships. Like, no, 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 you, you don't lift up hands that are like covered in in wrath and argumentativeness. Like, don't, don't be that person that comes saying, you know, this and that, and then you're just going to go speak evil about somebody. And then it continues saying, okay, so that's how the men's attitude should be. Here's how the women's women, attitude should be. Yeah. Likewise, I want women to adorn themselves with proper clothing, modestly and discreetly, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly garments, but rather by means of good works, as is proper for women making a claim to godliness. A woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness. Uh, and then it goes on to explain uh, within the church, I do not allow women to exercise authority over a man in the church, um, <clears throat> but to remain quiet. Again, in context, in context, Paul is not saying women never speak, not even in the home, not at the dinner table, not when you're out and about. No, he's saying, but I, 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 a woman must remain quiet. In the church, when you're learning, the woman is not uh, expected to be the one asking questions on behalf of the family. The, the husband is supposed to take that lead role to ask important questions on behalf of the family. If there's ever questions or doubts or concerns, the woman is to, to you know, relate those questions to the husband and the husband's to speak on the behalf of the home. It's always establishing that headship. You know, the husband should be responsible for the home, financially providing, protectively in all aspects. Um, that is just the way it works. It's the way God made it. So in that way, the woman should come to her husband and he should ask the preacher or the leader, mm -hmm. not not the woman saying, uh, hey, you know, shut up. I don't agree with you anyway, husband. Hey, is he allowed to do that to me? Like, is he allowed to talk to me? Shouldn't he tell him to get a better job? Like, you shouldn't have disagreement and discord within the local church. There's supposed to be that that unity in that family where the woman says, hey, uh, ask about this if there's any questions or what, like it just, it, there has to be a proper order and that's what it's talking about. It's not saying women are not equal. It's not saying women aren't important. It's not saying men are smarter. It's not saying any of that. It's saying just the order of life, the order of family, the order of, of, um, of submissiveness is just set this way by God. 
So this is speaking about how a woman ought to behave and act within a local church. Why? Because they're coming out of pagan nations where they dress like lunatics and they're influenced by that society. So mm -hmm. they're coming out of a place where to have the brightest, most showy, disco ball-like, noticeably kind of clothing is the best thing ever during their pagan rituals. But not in church, not in worship. In worship, you shouldn't be the center of attention. You shouldn't be the most noticeable thing in the room, bouncing all the lights and reflections off of you because you got everything dangling and you're sparkly like a, like like it's a club. Like you should be submissive and humble, and you should go there to learn and hear the word of God. So if you're there showing off, um, making yourself the center of attention, you're wrong. You're taken away from the most important attention, which should be for the word of God. So that's uh that's what that's teaching. But if somebody takes this and immediately says. Oh, you can't braid your hair. That's sin. <laughs> what? Are you serious? There's other ways to do our hair is to grab attention. <laughs> it's like, it doesn't matter. You can't. But braid was considered very fancy, very elegant. Because they would like braid to get people's uh -huh. attention. That was the intention. So. Yeah. So, so far, what's your commentary on Timothy? Do you see now? Do you see how this is talking about an actual worship environment? It's not making yes. it. I just think about how this was an issue back then where things were just a lot worse than what we have now. So, well, no, I wouldn't agree with that. Well, we got women that are walking into church basically wearing spandex stuff, showing themselves off in a very noticeable way oh well, i guess i just think of you know bible times like both men and women have the same clothing like long drapes um you would just identify because of the hair the woman will cover their head mm -hmm. constantly it was just a culture thing so and they were uh, most of them were poor like you couldn't afford jewelry mm -hmm. so i could see how if one day a woman, a, statement, yeah. a woman wear jewelry is like, look what my husband got me. Yeah. Like it's, you know, now today it, we could for things. We, you know, we have the freedom to work, make money. Um, and I could see how that could be an issue. But yeah, this is. This it can is, be. I agree. Yes. I think anything can be an issue. It's, it's making a legalistic law about it. Mm -hmm. Saying this is sin against God. It's right. Like, no, no. Um, jewelry is not a sin against God. Alcohol is not a sin against God, believe <laughs> it or not. <laughs> like, you can't illegalize things saying the Bible says you can't if the Bible doesn't say that. So uh, misuse, um, a lack of moderation, abuse, addiction to, absolutely, to just about everything that shows and sometimes brings in sin into our lives. Mm -hmm. But in itself, it is not. So we, we have to be mindful of that. Um, um, so we're going to go into First Peter. Uh, the key verse is actually in chapter 3, verses mm -hmm. 1 to 4. However, I want to touch on the chapter that came before um, because it gives insight. Uh, verse 13 out of chapter 2 okay. says, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God that by doing right you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. Act as free men and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable. For this finds favor, if, for the sake of conscience towards God, a person bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly. For what credit is there, if, when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? But if when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. So it, it, it's going into saying, this is how I want you to behave. And it, it references earlier on saying, you know, Christ 
followed through submissively under the hand of God the Father for all the sufferings that he would endure on the way to Golgotha. On the way to his crucifixion, he suffered greatly and he submissively, silently obeyed the Father's will. This is his wonderful description of what we should be as servants. And that's why it goes into this saying, servants, submit, even if your master is harsh, no matter who, no matter what, submit because you're submitting to God. Um, so verse 21 says, for you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed. For you were continually straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. And here we go. Chapter 3. Mm -hmm. In the same way, and again, in the same way refers to everything that was said beforehand in this in the previous chapter, talking about Christ and submissiveness and uh, servanthood. In the same way, you wives be submissive to your own husbands so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. Your adornment must not be merely external, braiding the hair and wearing gold jewelry or putting on dresses, but let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. And then it goes on to say, for the holy women in former times also dress themselves with a meek and patient spirit. This is used to say, can't braid your hair, can't wear jewelry. <laughs> You can't even put on dresses because this says putting on clothes. Uh -huh. It doesn't say putting on fancy clothes. It just says putting on clothes. But we have to understand what this is talking about. This is talking about submitting to those that are head over you, even if they are rude or harsh or mistreating or not pleasant, because you're giving a testimony to who God is by your behavior. And that testimony might win your master or your ruler or your employer over to God because they see your submissiveness to God even though they don't deserve such good treatment from you because they are harsh, they are unreasonable, they are disobedient to the word of God. So you might win people over to God by your submissiveness to God, by your humble attitude, by your graciousness, by your obedience to those that you should obey, masters, rulers, employers, whatever it might be. And it says, in that same manner, wives, even if you have a husband that doesn't believe, you can win him over. You never know. You might be able to win him over to Christ. Not by showing off your body. The priority is not supposed to be external. Mm -hmm. Take care of yourself. But that's not going to get them into the kingdom. Your dangling jewelry is not going to get them to want Jesus more. It might just bring stress. It might just bring stress because now you got to buy all this stuff that they're so obsessed with. Um, here's uh, Alexander Nisbet uh, from the, I have the uh, Banner Truth set of the Geneva Bible Commentary. Yeah. And this one talks uh, for First and Second Peter. It comments on verses three and four and oh, says okay. this. It says, the apostle gives here two further directions to believing women for attaining to such a conversation as, or conversation means life, such a conversation as, through the Lord's blessing, might prove a means of gaining their unbelieving husbands. The one is negative, that they should not be too curious and superfluous in trimming their outward man. The other is positive, that their great pains should be to have their inward man adorned with the grace of God especially meekness and peaceableness of spirit in reference to their husbands and the Lord's dispensation in tying them to such men and to a cross with them, which last he presses by two arguments. The first is that this was an ornament that would not wax old as others do. The second is that it is in very high esteem with the Lord and therefore as they desire to gain their husbands by their outward carriage, 
their great care should be to attain to a right frame of spirit within. That's emphasizing that their submissiveness to God should also be their intention to aim at giving God glory mm-hmm. and just dis- just uh, displaying the Christian life. That does not mean show off your Christianity in a rude, arrogant, proud manner. Like pray louder than you need to so people can hear you praying. That's not what we're talking about when we say show off God. We're saying just honor God. Honor him in your life. You don't have to have the biggest veil so everybody sees it. That's not what it's talking mm-hmm. about. That's pride and arrogance. You don't walk around with a veil telling everyone they don't got one and now they're not holy. That's not what we're talking about. And I hope this was very clearly um, understood when you read it because when this scripture was presented and read to me when I was taking Bible studies after baptism, this this scripture was used to clarify why it was important to wear skirts. Yeah. And modestly that this is why we do it because this is what god wants nothing what andrew just read <laughs> yeah. if i remember clearly that was it they just read first peter chapter three verse three that's it not which before is, or after which is which is the your adornment must not be merely external so ladies our our dress code shouldn't be provocative we should not track so let's to keep it modestly with the long dress the long skirts because it says here braiding the hair and wearing the gold jewelry or pulling the pulling on dresses am i reading putting that right? on putting on dresses but let it be the hitting person of the heart now again this is not saying okay you can't braid your hair mm-hmm. you can't wear gold you can't put on dresses. You have to walk around with your undies on. Because that's that's the literal way. You have to <laughs> literally read it that way if that's what you're going to do with scripture. You either read the whole thing literally or you understand there's an emphasis there being made. Um, and that's what they used yeah. to teach about the dress code. And it had nothing the, to do with it. The Preaching the Word Bible commentary series. This one's written by David R. Helm. He covered First and Second Peter and Jude. Now here's his commentary on verses three and four. Uh, so, what does this living hope and soul-winning conduct look like in Christian wives? Peter begins his answer, just as he did when describing our eternal inheritance. By way of contrast, he tells us what good deeds and honorable conduct do not look like in Christian wives. Do not let your adorning be external: the braiding of hair, the wearing of gold, the putting on of clothes. Peter's culture, like our own, had an obsession with external adornment. Women were under enormous pressure to look beautiful. Mm -hmm. They were fixated on their hair, the wearing of jewelry, and clothing. In response, Peter wants Christian women not to be overly concerned about external beauty. Only the famed children's book character, Amelia Bedelia, could misunderstand the meaning of this verse. Amelia was a household servant for Mr. and Mrs. Rogers, and Amelia took everything she was told to do literally, woodenly. So she would put real sponges in the sponge cake she was baking or pitch a tent by throwing it into the woods. An Amelia Bedelia interpretation of this verse would leave women without any braided mm. braiding of hair, wearing of jewelry, or wearing of clothing. Peter is not advocating any such thing. His concern is one of emphasis, as any discerning reader will understand. The pressures placed on Christian women by today's culture are nothing short of oppressive. Women today can't walk into a store without being bombarded with shelves devoted to hair products. Mm -hmm. They can't walk down the street without being overwhelmed by the need for more jewelry. Women cannot open a magazine without being assaulted by the sense that their own clothes are threadbare of anything worth wearing. This passion for external adornment comes at a terrible cost for today's women. The sense of never looking good enough, never being pretty enough, never measuring up. Women are made to feel inferior, ugly, and unlovable, and the consequences are mounting. It is with a sense of irony that then that we recognize that the Bible leads the way against such oppression and that Peter thinks more highly of women than does the culture in which we live. Peter wants to free women from the obscene obsession of looking good. So what are women Christian 
to be concerned about instead? Here's the verse. But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is God in God's sight is very precious. Peter calls upon Christian wives and women to adorn themselves with the imperishable beauty located in the hidden person of the heart. Literally, he asks wives to be concerned to dress the inner man. Peter tells Christian women to pay attention to the adornment with which they are dressing the interiors of their soul. Arise, put your feet on the ground, and get dressed from the inside out. Further, he desires that they cultivate a gentle and quiet spirit. By way of application, women should consider how much time it takes to prepare getting ready in the morning. Then see that Peter is urging them to take time to adorn the inner person as well. Christian women ought to be known for putting on the clothes of Christ. After all, he was gentle and meek. The motivation for women taking the time to adorn their souls is now put forward by Peter. The later half of verse 4 says that in doing so, they become precious in the sight of God. In other words, when God looks upon them, he is glad to have them for his bride. Men and fathers, is this the kind of woman we are teaching our sons to look for in a wife? Is this what we ourselves appreciate most in women? Are our hearts in tune with the heart of God concerning what is considered precious? Beautiful. That's yes. well said. Solid. Solid Very commentary. Good. It just shows. You would have to take everything incredibly literally to read that and say, oh, can't wear gold, can't braid your hair. But you have to add in that third part. Can't wear dresses, can't wear clothes. Women can't wear clothes. You can't do that. It's important that we understand how to read the Bible. Mm -hmm. Not everything is literal. There is some such thing as, um, what's the different types? Not everything is literal. Some things are poetic. Some things are analogy. Some things are um, a parable like Jesus went through. Some things are literal. But you can't take like half of a sentence literally and the other half unliterally and then make an entire doctrine mm. out of it. That's not how you read. So I, I could say the attention there. Let's let's take the stress out of this. Let's just forbid, let's put a dress code for women and men, men and women. Yeah. Just let them know this is the apostolic church dress code, not the Bible's mm -hmm. dress code. But it's they fine don't. if you have a church and says, mm -hmm. Hey, in our church we don't want women coming in with uh with with tight leggings because we don't want their bodies being shown off. Mm -hmm. So please put something else on if you come to our church and you're a member. Why? Just because we don't we don't prefer it in our church. And if you're willing to follow, it's great. If not, that's mm -hmm. fine. Go and be blessed in another place. Fine. You can have a dress code in places if you feel like it, but you can't make a law saying mm -hmm. this comes from the Bible if it doesn't. That's the problem. So And this is why it was easy for us. Well, easy. It took us a while. Well, yeah. Would you say it took was it easy or a while? It was easy in the fact that I didn't have to I didn't have to get all these theological books and commentaries to read the Bible verse by verse mm -hmm. and understand the context. I did benefit from all of the helps. I stand on the shoulders of those that came before me. Mm -hmm. I benefit from previous theologians. But this is simple reading though. Yeah. Like it doesn't actually take a lot to read two chapters and realize it's all connected. Now, I will admit I was a little bit upset with myself. Like, how did I not see this? But then again, there was no harm in my perspective. Like, well, until you uh, criticize and judge everyone outside of the apostolic yeah, church to hell. So there is harm. <laughs> <laughs> that's the problem. I mean, if there was no problem, there'd be me, nothing to talk like, about. I, I didn't suffer in high school for oh, getting yeah. rid of the pants. Yeah, personally. And, you know, you know yeah. personally, personally, it, it did no harm. Uh, now... Yeah, there's no harm. I just, I feel like people have this expectation that we left and we're, they automatically assume we're just going to dress ungodly. And But their standard of ungodly is so strict. Like women with pants is ungodly. Uh, cutting your hair is ungodly. Getting a haircut for women, letting it trim a little bit shorter is considered unapostolic, unbiblical. True, like, very true. There's, it, it's not like 
It's but, not like they're actually identifying true ungodliness. They're actually identifying based on their own doctrines from the church. So anything that doesn't look apostolic, now you're just in the world, you're a sinner, dirty you. Yeah. That's the perspective. And I just find it funny because I even get a little statements where they know I left, but they wonder why I still dress like if I take a picture of a nice, modest dress, no makeup, it's like I'm still holding on to the apostolic roots. And I don't know if I am. I don't think so. I just, I feel comfortable wearing a nice, modest dress. I feel pretty in a dress. I feel girly in a dress. And at the end of the day, you, you're not, I'm not here to please the women in the church. I'm here to please God in doing so that in doing so i'm honoring my husband because i do get your opinion about wardrobes like what you like what you're attracted to what's appropriate for our family but yeah i i guess for me it wasn't hard it wasn't hard for you once we we understood the scriptures that they the apostolic church was really like pushing in like this is why we do things gain the clearly the understanding it was like oh okay this is okay no wonder i never had that conviction before Mm -hmm. to just walk to the store real quick with my leggings you know so everyone's different i'm trying to answer the question that we got in case you listen to this episode Mm -hmm. what would you say if it's a couple and it's one person like the husband or the wife that is having a hard time being obedient to the rules well uh, what what do you mean by having a hard time well you're going to church you're a committed member but you're having a hard time accepting the rules of the dress code and you're questioning like how am i going to bring up my kids if i don't truly believe in it oh i'd say first and foremost if you have any issues uh prayer and the person you're married to mm-hmm. should be involved in in these conversations um if you can't talk to the person you've betrothed yourself to you've connected with in life soul and body um you need to do something about that or pray about that happening in your in your life and marriage i'm not saying your marriage is in shambles but there's something going on in that in the way that maybe you view it or your husband views it or your partner um that's unhealthy we are supposed to be able to talk to our beloveds about our worries, fears, doubts, concerns. To not be able to say that, that's, I don't know what that would look like. That that's seems very scary. unhealthy. Yeah. yeah, that seems unhealthy. So I'd say um, this has to be brought up to the person you're with and you love. I don't think it would, it would make sense for that person to run to pastor saying, my wife's worried or like, that just seems like, you said something, now I'm going to go complain about it. Like, I really think this is something that should be discovered through scripture. Um, however, I, I understand some people might run straight to the pastor saying, well, my with, wife's worried. With it's our like, testimony, ah. I hope you have an idea of what might happen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A lot of things might happen. So, well, just see how it goes. I, I, I see that if, the, you know, we're told to go straight to our pastor when yeah. we have questions. Yeah, because that's, that's what we were taught. Mm-hmm. You have to go to pastor for everything. Um he has to be aware of everything. It's kind of, it wasn't good. <laughs> That's not a good view to have. Um, mm-hmm. Your pastor is not your God. Mm-hmm. Uh, your pastor is a sinner that is positioned to feed and supply you the word of God and to be responsible in their prayers and their edification of your life and soul. They are not responsible for your house. They are not responsible for your finances. They are not supposed to peer into every little thing of your life. That's that's not the pastor's role, but they are to be invested and available for you um, as their as their flock. Um, when you view a pastor unhealthily, you put undue pressure on them, and they have unrealistic expectations of themselves, which probably stresses them out. Um, so, people don't learn to come to Christ and trust Him. That's the problem. Um, when you realize that. God actually is involved and continually there in your life. Um, you can actually take the Bible and with faith, actual trust, open the Bible and say, God, I'm going to study your word about this and this. And, and I'm, I, I need my answers from you. 
And you will learn to find them in the Bible, not by hopping around everywhere, but by staying steady in some areas, by opening commentary, getting some perspective, by starting conversations and studying some sections of scripture, like big sections, get the context of scripture, and you'll be able to find some of those answers. But I'd say that uh, the first and foremost, uh, let it be something done in prayer. Let it be something done in unity with your spouse. Uh, If you're having questions or doubts, that should be a conversation you can have. And um, if you're feeling the conviction that you're being demanded unbiblically to obey a standard, which is what we came to understand. Um, you don't have to like throw it all, you know, throw all caution to the wind and whatever, and just start dressing however you want. That could seem rebellious and disrespectful maybe to your spouse if they're not ready to stand on that same principle with you. Um, And that can make them end up in some really weird conversations too. Like, hey, why is your wife doing this? Um, Or to your wife, like, hey, why is your husband doing this? This should be something agreed upon when you actually start uh, unconforming to legalistic standards. It should be something done together. Because I guarantee you, if you're in a legalistic church like the Apostolic Assembly or the Pentecostal Church, if spouse does something, other spouse will hear about it. And it won't be nice. Uh, it will be like, hey, you need to fix your house or what's going on. Like, it's not going to be like, oh, brother, hey, that's cool. Didn't expect her to wear pants. Cool. It's not going to be positive. It's going to be negative. It's going to be a rebuke. It's going to be, it might even be abusive. Like, there's a lot of different things that could take place. If they, someone might come straight to spouse and say something really rude to, to, to toss her spirit down into the, you know, into turmoil. Like, Anxiety, depression could take place uh, because of how people handle it in a very arrogant, legalistic fashion. Oh, you're immediately sinning against God. Like that kind of mentality will lead her to depression or forced conformity, not out of joy, love, and, and embracing Christ, but out of fear of hell and judgment. It's not right at all. So it has to be something uh, prepared for. But I'd say um, bring that up, do some studying, ask questions, and together if you can. Um, or together in agreement, let one person go and approach the ministry and say, hey, uh, our, our home, we have a question. We're studying this. We, we don't agree with this. Uh, can you answer this biblically for us? And if they just take that verse and say, see, no jewelry, I think we've explained enough to at least get a little bit more out of that conversation. Maybe that might be helpful to bring some of that commentary, to bring some of the context to see like, hey, well, that kind of doesn't make sense because the scripture says something more here than just a blatant little rule no jewelry in the end of the day when it comes to married married couples with children you can't you can't trust or rely on the pastors the ministers the teachers in the church to teach your kids what the word of god is i i kind of learned that Mm -hmm. later on that we my husband and i we're the ones indoctrinating our kids so if you have questions about your the church that you're going to that you're scared because as a mom that's like we have anxiety all the time like what am i teaching my kids what am i showing them what am i like where am i putting them who are they surrounded with and if you have if you're going to a church where you're questioning you don't feel comfortable then yeah, that's going to affect your kids. Because if you're taking your kids to a church where they're being told you have to look and speak in a certain way, but when they come home, mom and dad are doing the opposite, that's not that's not the church's fault. Mm-hmm. That's mom and dad. You know, you're doing that. So yeah, like you said, communication is key. You should yeah. be able to talk to your husband, your wife, to say like, what do we want? For our kids, what kind of upbringing, what kind of biblical, <sighs> I'm out of breath, <laughs> what kind of biblical teaching? So uh, I hope this helps. Yeah. And I hope we answered the question. And remember, this is apostolic Pentecostal rules. Um, yeah. It is also in many other churches. There is a standard expectation, especially traditional. There is a standard. That's fine. But um, you'll see you'll see the difference in a legalistic church Mm -hmm. and a church where everyone just wears suits. Cause when the guy comes in with a t-shirt and shorts, no one's like telling him, brother, you can't wear that. (laughs) Like you're seeing a solid, healthy biblical church. Like some people wear suits, some people wear sweats. It's, it is in essence, part of their personal conviction. It is also part of the culture, but you'll see it's not a dogmatic issue saying, Oh, it's only ties here, brother. That's sin. 
if you don't like no that's that's not a bible grounded church um culture to teach that so yeah i think that's it for now well this was the milk and meat podcast thank you for joining us and we'll see you soon god bless god bless because i'd be worried about your soul why you still be doubting you got a soul like you need to see to believe these things but you believe things that you've never seen the like feelings and hopes and dreams the future emotions and gravity and sadly everything you're rejecting makes this whole life a tragedy and i got something to say i got something to say i got something to say to the world and i got a place to make i got steps to take I